Hello and welcome. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Chiricahua Community Health for hosting today's session on the diagnosis of primary headache disorders with Dr. Cho. Dr. Cho is a retired is retired from the Permanente Medical Group Neurologist with over 30 years of experience in general neurology and in vascular neurology. Throughout her career with Santa Clara Kaiser Medical Center, she enjoyed teaching residents both in the outpatient clinic setting as well as in the inpatient neurology consult service. She was the clinical lead for the Northern California KP Clinical Practice Guidelines for Stroke, and she was also actively involved in developing the KP Telestroke Program. And now we are very thankful that she is one of our Maven Project volunteers. Dr. Cho, when you are ready, please begin. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. I guess one uh, additional um, information I should have had to give me some credit credibility for giving this talk is that I also ran an outpatient um, headache management program for many years. Now, today we're going to talk about migraines. I have no financial um, disclosures to make. We're going to talk about how to make a diagnosis of migraine and talk about the pathophysiology, why we get migraines, and talk about medications. I made this slide so that this, the, the presentation with a lot more detail than I'm gonna go into during the talk, um, so that when you get the slide deck, you know, it would, you know, it would make sense. Um, so um, bear with me because the first few slides I'm gonna go through uh, pretty quickly. Um, uh, but let's first start with um, some patients, kind of a morning wake up exercise. There are three patients here. Pick one that worries you the most. First patient, 20 year old female who wakes up with the worst headache ever. She says, Ugh, my head really hurts, like it's going to explode. And I'm sick to my stomach and I'm sensitive to light and sound and smell. I, the second patient is a 60 year old male. He says, there's a new headache for about a month now. Okay. He says, I used to get sick headaches as a child. You know, but this new headache doesn't make him sick like the old ones used to do. And it's just more or less constant. And he's been forgetting things a little bit, which kind of worries him. The third patient is a 50 year old male. He says he gets headaches in the morning. He says it's like an alarm clock, boom, 5 a.m. Uh, it wakes him up. And it's been going on for about a year, happens a few times a month. Um, pain is sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right. And it lasts about two hours. And he's fine otherwise, but you know, he's just a bit worried because it's really strange. Um, so if you were seeing any of these patients, obviously the first thing would be to take a good history and do, do a thorough neurological exam. And then you're gonna think through and say, hmm, is this a worrisome headache or not a worrisome headache? And the main point here with this slide I want you to make is just that there is actually criteria that is set forth by the International Headache Society that you can look up. It's called ICHD3 criteria for a lot of different types of headaches, including cluster headaches. But let's go back to our patients. One way to think about whether something is worrisome or not worrisome is to go through this fairly well-known screen called a pin screen. Three simple questions. In the last three months, did you have headaches? Um, uh, did you have these symptoms with your headaches? First question, photophobia, did the lights bother you? Number two, incapacity. Did the headaches limit your ability to work? or do whatever else you need to do. Three, nausea. Did you feel sick to your stomach? And if you say yes to at least two out of three, 
the most likely diagnosis is migraines. And that's been borne out with large um, studies and um, you know the sensitivity and specificity was pretty good. Now, another way to think about this is to have a list of things that you associate with, with primary headaches or migraines and list of things that should raise a red flag in your mind and put that headache or that patient into a higher risk. Now, if you look at this column, the low risk, it pretty much is the definition of migraines, right? It's a chronic disorder characterized by episodic headaches. They have headaches and they don't have headaches, okay? And the location often changes, although, you know, a lot of people uh, report, ah, this headache is always on the left side. You know, if you push them a little bit, sometimes the, the, they, will re, they will report that sometimes the headache is on different other, you know, different parts of the head. The pain is often described as a throbbing pain. And um, there's often sensitivity to smell, light, and noise. And people report that there are triggers, you know. Uh, they went up to the mountains, got the headaches, the weather front is coming through, and they got their headaches, or it's associated with the hormonal uh, cycles. The high risk um, uh, uh, factors that you want, we want to keep in mind are um, the following. One, it's a new onset. Okay, especially age after after age fifty, because brain tumors become more common as we get older, and then or you know somebody who's had headaches, like our second gentleman, but you know the headache pattern, the headache is different. Okay, the pattern has changed, and there's really no good explanation. It's not like they changed their jobs to a night shift, and now they're getting headaches. There's clear explanation there. Okay. Headache is progressive, it's not episodic, side-locked pain. Pain is always on one side, okay? And um, uh, if there are you know, symptoms involving the, the, the eyes painful with autonomic symptoms, tearing, redness of the eye, the pupil's eyes change, um, uh, limitations of the eye, double vision, all those things are, of course, really very worrisome. Um, you know, compared to somebody who describes as throbbing pain, um, explosive pain, steady without just constant, just pain is much more worrisome to me. Okay, steady, featureless pain. And when somebody says the headache changes with position, um, that's really worse, and whether it's high or low, uh, I, I'm sorry, whether the headache gets worse with standing up or lying down, because that indicates a possibility there is a problem with CSF pressure, okay? So, um, you know, you've seen these, you, you've seen your patient, you've gone through your process, and you're thinking, you know, I would like to get a brain imaging, Okay, and then the question is, well, a CT scan or an MRI? Okay, you know, these days, I mean, it's pretty much the MRI. Uh, it's widely available, okay? And um, it can tell us a lot more than a CT scan. Okay, couple of caveats though. It's very, very common to see chronic microvascular changes, even in um, somebody 20, 30 years of age. And migraineurs often have um, more what we call UBOs, you know, un <laughs> unidentified bright objects or the little spots. And a lot of radiologists refer to it as chronic microvascular changes or um, signal abnormalities. And often, um, if you provide the history, um, the patient has a lot of migraines, the radiologist might even comment that these are findings often seen in migraineurs. So just, just be aware that chronic microvasculars, um, clinically insignificant changes are very common and be ready to explain it to the patients. I'm sorry. Um, and be aware of incidental findings. 
Okay, one to two percent of brain MRIs will show incidental findings like venous angiomas that do not bleed and really don't have any clinical uh, significance, or called AVM, small aneurysms, small meningiomas, or asymptomatic strokes. And one study showed that after a certain age in older patients, about eight percent of people have um, evidence of asymptomatic stroke on their brain scans. So just be aware. Now, when, when would you do a CT scan, okay? Well, CT scan is really good still for ruling out acute hemorrhage, uh, like subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage in the first 24 hours, okay? CT scan is much less prone to movement artifacts. If you have an agitated patient, you know, who can't really stay still, uh, you know, CT scan would be uh, much more likely to give you the, the answers that you want, okay? And it's actually pretty good for looking for uh, looking at the fine, uh, looking for large brain tumors, large strokes, and subdural hematomas. So, so um, let's spend a few minutes talking about emergency headaches. These are headaches, you know, hopefully these patients are actually going to an emergency room, but if they show up in your clinic, um, you wouldn't want to take a week getting an MRI or your, your brain imaging cleared by whatever, whoever the authority needs to clear those scans. You would want to send these people to emergency rooms. We always get scared when we hear the word worst ever headaches. Oh, doc, this is the worst headache I've ever had, okay? Uh, one thing I want to point out is that it's actually not the severity so much, it's the speed. How quickly did it get to the worst of a headache? If, you st if the patient says, I started getting a headache and over a few hours, it's just kind of, it's like the worst headache I ever got. That's not as worrisome to me as somebody who says, I had no headache and boom, I felt something and within the definition is within a minute, it just got to the worst ever headache. That's what we call thunderclap headaches. Why do we worry about these worst ever thunderclap headaches, headaches that go from zero to 100 miles per hour in a minute, very, very quickly, okay? One is that it could be a sign of an aneur cerebral aneurysm. Aneurysms can just pop and the person can have massive amount of blood, boom, right there or they can have a little leak, a sentinel bleed, just a little leak. And um, symptoms that you want to look for, or was there a, a loss of consciousness initially? Was there vomiting? Was there a stiff neck? Okay. And when you're examining the patient, you'll be looking for the eye, pay attention to the eyes. What do their pupils look like? Are they asymmetrical? Okay. Uh, there are other causes for thunderclap headaches, okay? And such as what we call RCVS, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. And there's actually a benign syndrome called primary thunderclap headaches. But the main thing is if somebody reports to you that headache began with some of these symptoms I mentioned here, like loss of consciousness, vomiting, stiff neck, and you see some abnormal pupils and the headache went from zero to hundred miles per hour, it became very severe very quickly. Even, even if they look pretty good now, if that's the history at the beginning, you should send them to the emergency room. Carotid artery dissection or vertebral artery dissection. I've seen several over my career um, patients coming into the clinic, they look pretty good, okay? And they might complain about a neck pain or they might just have kind of nuanced that headache. And it's not that bad. That's why they didn't go to the emergency room. But when I see them, their pupils are not bright. They have a Horner syndrome, okay? And um, so those ones, I get very worried about carotid artery dissection. I mentioned this earlier, right? Eyes, if, there, if you are seeing a patient with the abnormal eye symptoms or signs around the eyes or in the eye or around the eyes, um, that's very worrisome, okay? 
And uh, the reason being is that the cavernous sinus infections, thrombosis, dural fistulas, um, you know, acute angle glaucoma, these are all really worrisome things that the patient needs to go to the emergency room for. So, um, you know, basically headaches that come on very quickly, you're worried about aneurysms, pain that involves neck or head, okay, with eye asymmetrical pupils, you're worried about carotid artery dissection, um, headache with abnormal orbital or periorbital symptoms, you're worried about the cavernous sinus. So these are patients who need to go to the emergency room. And of course, with papilledema and um, symptoms and signs concerning for infection of the central nervous system, they should be sent to the emergency room as well. So let's change gears and let's talk about why do we get headaches? Vascular theory. I remember when I was in training, I was told that we get migraines because the blood vessels on the scalp, you know, they um, get inflamed and initially they get become smaller, narrower, and there's less blood to the brain. And so you get neurologic auras and then they vasodilate, they get bigger and you get that throbbing boom, 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 boom kind of pain. Real quick, Dr. Cho, we do have a question. Oh, sure. Is there any age limit to say, no, this patient is too young to have a migraine? Oh, no. Thank you. That's really a good question. Um, and it actually goes, uh, it, it actually um, takes, that, takes us to the pathophysiology of why people get migraines. Um, let me start, let me just say the answer is no. And then I will explain it um, in more detail as we talk about the pathophysiology, okay? So the, and let's actually delve right in. That's actually really a good question, a perfect timing. Thank you. So patients ask me, you know, dad, why do I get migraines? I mean, why? Okay, and what I, what I tell them is, you know, genetics. I mean, you get it from your mom and dad. Genetics play a major role. It, it's not just a simple, a single gene genetic, it's a complex polygenic multifactorial genetics, okay? And, you know, doctor, scientists have done these models and they estimate that your, your family history, your genes account for 40 to 50% of uh, a person's susceptibility to actually having migraines. So your genes have set up the vulnerability whether you're gonna be prone to having headaches or not. Uh, we know this, we've known it for a long time because relatives of migraines have three times the risk of non-migraineurs, okay? And there are even migraines where we know a specific gene. Uh, there's this thing called familiar hemiplegic migraines. Um, and um, these people, when they get their migraines, it's not just their headaches, their aura is hemiplegia. So it's a pretty bad deal, but um, you know these patients actually um, have been can be diagnosed by testing for these specific genes. So it's clear that it's a genetic disorder that sets you up that that determines your vulnerability for whether you're going to have migraines or not. But um, you know, pay, um, uh, and, and so by this point, the patients are still saying, well, you know, um, uh, the pain is so bad, it just feels really bad. I mean, like, you know, the, like the first patient, right? Um, it feels like it's intense pain. It feels like something's gonna explode in my head. It goes boom, 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 boom. It feels like there's gotta be something wrong with the brain. And patients will ask for a brain scan and, um, you know, I, I just tell them that uh, MRIs and CT scans are actually normal in the migraines. Um, I tell them if I look at Jane over here, I see she has dark hair, brown eyes. Uh, she has two ears, two eyes. She has a mouth. I know what she looks like. I can describe her to you. 
but I wouldn't know whether Jane can talk, whether Jane can see, whether Jane can hear. I wouldn't know anything other than what she looks like. And that's what the MRIs and CT scans do. They tell me what your brain looks like, but they don't tell me how the brain actually works. And that is the, and the reason for um, you having migraines is that your genes set up that vulnerability. And when, there, when that, what I call headache generator, when that headache generator, a bunch of brain cells inside the brain, when they become excited, when they get turned on, that process results in inflammation of the brain cells and of the, um, of the uh, blood vessels in your scalp and result in the phenomenon known as migraines. And uh, let's go into that. And, and also I reassure them that migraines do not damage the brain. Okay, so-, so I have another question to... real quick. Sure. I'm so sorry to interrupt. What is the relationship between ocular migraines, aura without pain and the regular? Could you repeat that question again? What is the relationship between ocular migraines aura without pain and the regular. Oh, okay. So um, very good. And let me again, uh, let me go. I love those questions. Aura uh, and without aura. I'm going to go through this headache generator, this headache theory. This is why I love talking about the headache pathophysiology of migraines because it actually allows us to explain, answer those questions and explain them um, scientifically. So let me uh, talk about the headache generator. The idea began in 1987. Raskin, a, a headache scientist at UC, uh, a neurologist, a headache neurologist at UCSF reported in the journal Headache, 15 patients they had electrodes put in because they had chronic pain. And we knew that periactal gray matter, which is uh, an area in the brainstem, uh, had a lot to do with pain, trans uh, pain signal transmission. So the idea was that we put the electrodes there and see if we can reduce pain. Well, lo and behold, after surgery, they developed migraines and they never had migraines before. Okay, and I think some of them had migraines with aura. So he and so the prevailing theory prior to 1987 was that the migraine actually began outside the brain in the blood vessels on the scalp. So he proposed that migraines actually may originate in from inside the brain, okay, and not from these blood vessels on the scalp. And he called it the headache generator. It took a while, almost 10 years before we actually saw a, a visual evidence, PET scan evidence of this headache generator. This is somebody who experienced a spontaneous bout of migraine while inside a PET scanner. And there was hyperactivity in these red areas. And the main one is actually this one. And that is actually the periaqueductal gray area. So this became kind of the uh, uh, neuroimaging evidence that migraine may be from an imbalance in activity between the brainstem nuclei that regulate pain, nociception is pain, and vascular control, okay? And then we move to 2016. This is studies from Germany, and there was this patient who um, agreed to have a daily fMRI for a month and not use any medicines at all. This was his contribution to science. What was found was that there are actually three areas that are very active and they are constantly talking to each other. And the three areas are the hypothalamus, the spinal um, uh, trigeminal nuclei, and then this is the dorsal red uh, rostral pons, this is kind of the red dot that I was showing you earlier. 
And this is kind of the, the red dot here, the brainstem is where we thought was kind of the headache generator. Of course, the brain is much more complicated that, than that. It turns out that the latest neuroimaging studies suggest that it's actually might be the hypothalamus that's the main drive, okay? Because that's the uh, about 24 hours prior to the onset of migraines, the hypothalamus seems to be the one uh, strength uh, communicating with the other, with the uh, brainstem and the trigeminal nucleus here, strengthening their communication that um, re that result in the start of the migraine. Okay, so now um, childhood. Um, so when you so when you think about why we get migraines, think of it like seizures or epilepsy. You know there is a a a, a vulnerability, right? Uh, a person has a, a a tendency to have seizures either on a genetic basis or from uh, you know subsequent head trauma or something. But let's take the case of genetic predisposition. Somebody is prone to having a seizure. Um, they um, the seizure can be triggered by lack of sleep, okay? They can then uh, develop kind of a prodrome. A lot of seizure patients, they say they feel like they're gonna have a seizure. You know, think of Dostoevsky, right? You know, his novel uh, just, you know, describes this really well. There's a prodrome for a seizure, there's an aura, and there's the ictus, the seizure. And then after the seizure, they're really tired afterwards. With a, with a migraine, it seems to, for a lot of people, it seems to be the same process, okay? The vulnerabilities set by the genetic predisposition that gets triggered by um, not drinking coffee or going, you know, by the weather from coming through, by what a lot of migraineurs refer to as, as triggers. And they start to feel a prodrome, like they're going to get a headache, okay? And then there's the aura or the non-neurologic symptoms, uh, like flashing lights and zigzag lines, okay? Uh, or numbness and tingling. Um, there are associated symptoms of sensitivity to light and noise and vom nausea, vomiting. And then there's the ictus, the pain. And after the migraine is over, a lot of people report that they feel really tired. So now the question of do kids, is there a young age at which you, you say, ah, oh, this can't be a migraine? Um, you know, um, young, when I used to do pediatric neurology um, uh, early on in my career, I saw a lot of kids with migraines and, and uh, especially in young kids, cyclical vomiting. Kids just who out of the blue, boom, vomit, and they just have this cycles of it. It's actually a very well-known uh, manifestation of a migraine. We call that a migraine. Um, if the question is, how about the pain part? Um, well, you know, young kids, they really don't know how to describe pain, but definitely have, we see migraines, even the pain syndrome of migraines at all ages. The second question, what's the difference between the aura and migraine with aura, with the ocular flashing lights and zigzag lines and without. Um, it's just a different point along that spectrum of migraine that I was describing from vulnerability to um, the prodrome, to the aura, to the headache, and then the post headache syndrome. If you talk to people who have migraines, uh, they will say, they will report uh, headaches where it goes through each phase and headaches where it just jumps. You know, they just get boom, they get the headache and they don't get anything else. So people with migraine, with people with um, migraines with aura will often have headaches, migraines without aura as well. Hopefully that will, that, that uh, I've answered your questions. If not, then just um, feel free to, um, uh, raise your hand again. We do have a question. Um, in okay. the primary care setting, how often are headaches of neurological origin versus eye or ENT origin? Um, I have a slide later on that talks about sinus headaches. And most people, 
who report sinus headaches actually turn not to have sinus headaches. So the American Headache Society's recommendation is before you diagnose somebody with um, quote unquote sinus headaches, but no clinical features of other than the pain, they don't have sinus drainage and all that kind of stuff. They just feel that they have sinus headaches, that you do sinus x-rays before you call them sinus headaches. Eye problems. Um, I think that you have to take the, the, the whole clinical picture in totality. Um, if, um, you know, if somebody reports having headaches, if they just look at their screen a lot or they use their eyes a lot, but they don't have headaches any other time, then, I mean, I think I would ask them to go and get, get their eye uh, uh, acuity uh, checked. But, you know, somebody says they get their headaches when they look at, when they're looking at the computers, but they also get headaches other times, then I would probably consider that I would wonder about the screens activating the light or just the uh, strain activating their vulnerability to having headaches. Thank you. So um, now we're gonna transition over to, to headaches. And I think what I'll do is I will um, move through. I, I have a whole section on the new headache medications that I think will be really important to cover. So I might go over this a little bit quickly here. Um, now, um, when I think about headache management, you know, when I see a headache patient, I try to kind of basically figure out, is this person someone I just need to figure out an abortive medication strategy. I mean, they don't, headache, they don't get headaches that often. And I just need to figure out something they can take that will return them back to their life as quickly as possible. Or is this somebody who has headaches a lot and I need to really just lower their threat or raise their threshold for having migraines or, or for having headaches? in which case that raising of the threshold is gonna require, require a preventive medication. So, you know, do I need to just figure out the pain, you know, pain management or do I need to figure, add a preventive medicine? Those are the two main questions that I'm thinking about when I see a patient. Uh, somebody with occasional headaches, Key thing is to avoid narcotics and any caffeine-containing medications, including Excedrin or any other over-the-counter medicines containing caffeine, because caffeine causes rebound headaches I will talk about. Um, so the idea is that if the headache that they get, you know, people will say, you know, I don't really get little headaches, or I just get really bad ones, or I get little ones and big, you know, pretty bad ones and just really intense ones. And you want to help them figure out what to do for each one. It really doesn't make sense um, for somebody who um, has all three different types or who gets only just really the worst headaches to always start with over-the-counter medicines, headaches not gone in two hours or in an hour, then you take the trip in. And then if that doesn't work, then you go here. I think what makes the most sense is to just kind of try to help the patient understand, match the pain intensity with the medicine that it that is most likely to work. Okay, um, you will have access to these slides, so I'm just gonna kind of move through here pretty quickly. Um, the idea here is to kind of understand the difference between uh, among the triptans. A lot of them are pretty much the same. Um, you have your favorites, um, but one way to think of them is, is to, to, to consider these that tend to work fast, have higher efficacy, they, they work fast. So um, more of the medicine is in, in the patient and work well um, versus these um, where they might be slower acting, but they last longer. So if somebody, takes a sumatriptan, it works pretty fast, but you know it comes back in two hours, I have to keep repeating, 
you might want to try at least a longer acting ones and see how they do. Injectables. So this is a patient who gets a lot of headaches. Okay. And these are the patients who take up a lot of your time. And for me, at least they were, you know, just very exhausting for me too. And I can't imagine how exhausted they are because I'm exhausted just listening to their headaches. A simple way um, for me to, uh, the simplest way I found to um, try to understand their headache, what I call the headache burden is to quantify it as how many days a week, a month do you get headaches? And the way I do that is to just use a Midas questionnaire. I say, how many days, five questions, how many days in the last three months did you miss work or school? How many days were you there, but you weren't really there? How many days did you not do any household work? How many days you kind of, you did it, you had to, but you know, your productivity was less than half 50%. And how many days did you actually miss something you really wanted to do? Like go to a party. And you don't, if a day you put a, you counted one day here, you don't count that same day here. So the maximum score is 90, okay. So uh, the idea is that if somebody's score is, let's say, um, you know, 10, okay, 10 in three months, okay, so that is like three days a month, and three days times 12, that's 36 days a year, that's almost losing a whole month. So uh, that's what I tell them. I say, listen, you, you, your score is 10. That's like losing a month. Would you be interested in taking a preventive medicine to reduce that number? The goal is to try to reduce at least by half. A key thing is to, so, yes. So we do have two questions. Sure. Um, so this is going back to the aura question. Uh, mm -hmm. She clarified, what about someone who periodically gets aura but has never gotten pain afterwards? Are they likely to progress to headaches in the future? Um, and not necessarily. There is kind of this strange phenomenon where people who never used to get auras start getting auras around late middle age, you know, now I've gotten into like an elder stage of my life. I don't know where the middle age is, <laughs> but around age 50, um, people start to developing auras when they never had auras before. People who used to have auras um, uh, with migraines with auras, the migraine part goes away and they just, the headache part goes away and they just get the auras. If you've always, I have seen patients who have only the auras and that's, that they've, they've always only had the auras. Um, will they, uh, will they ever, is it possible that they will get a migraine? The possibility is there because the whole pathophysiology for why they get that aura in the first place, the whole thing is there. It, it's in existence in their brain. So it's possible, but for whatever reason, that person is just very prone to just getting the aura and that's quite likely to continue. And then the next question is over imaging is a major problem in headache ev evaluation. We actually published about this in the late seventies. Do you image someone who presents with classic migraines for the first time? No, I don't. Sometimes what happens though is, you know, you, you have to make a decision about wanting to make progress in patient management, right? If you feel like this is such a huge obstacle that you cannot make it to the next step to, to help the patient have a better quality of life, you know, sometimes you give in, but I completely agree with you and I do not. Okay, um, so um, medication overuse headaches. So if you see somebody just leaves you, just listening to how often they get headaches, make you feel exhausted. Um, number one recommendation to the MIDAS questionnaire. The other, 
the other is to to see spend some time in and try to understand how much medication they use and i have always found that i just need to ask over and over and over um because I'm talking about caffeine, Excedrin, anacin, all the other pain medications that they take, even for their mild headaches. And the definition is that in the absence of another pathology, um, you know, they have headaches uh, on more than 15 days a month, and they use pain medications regularly more than two days out of the week. And it this this. Uh, pattern has been in presence for more than three months. It is thought that one to two percent of people may suffer from uh, medication overuse headaches, and they make up the bulk of the specialty specialty headache clinics. And it's considered to be one of the top causes for disability. And uh, we mentioned that the regular use means two, more than two days a week. And, um, you know, different medications have different levels of potential risk for causing medication rebound headaches. Very high risk are the opioids, caffeine containing drugs, intermediate to low are the triptans, and very low is the NSAIDs. And the idea about the um, medication rebound headaches, if you think of um, that headache generator theory, the neurovascular theory that I talked about, um, th there is a kind of a, th this is the way I describe it to the patients. I say, remember I showed you that picture with the red dot, you know, that's the headache generator uh, inside your head. Um, you take your Excedrin and what it does is it works, I and mean, this is a simplified version, but you know, it works to get rid of the pain that you're experiencing. That's the short term. The long term loop is that it actually goes back and turns on that that the headache generator even redder, even hotter. It's almost like a bad credit card. You have a credit card bill, and you borrow money to pay that credit card so that that credit card company is not sending you a bill. But in the meantime, the, the, the total amount you owe on that credit card is going up and building up even more, you're building up even more debt. So, you know, medi as I try to tell people, medication overuse headache pattern, when you're in that, it's like you're in bad credit card debt situation. Okay, and you need to get to the root of the problem. And patients love getting to the root of the problem, right? And I said, the root of the problem is manageable. We can do something about it. It's a little difficult, but we can definitely do it. And that is, you have to stop the pain medicine that you're taking. And studies have shown that just doing that by itself will reduce the headaches by more than 50%. But you know, you really need to work with a patient to come up with a realistic plan, especially if the caffeine containing medications are involved. Okay. Um, let me go over that. Um, so I would like to really go over the, um, yeah, I'm gonna try to move. The main thing about the preventive medications is that you need to start low and go up slow. Okay, like start with 10 milligrams of nortriptyline, 10 milligrams or five, even five milligrams of amitriptyline and go up slowly. And you try to reach the maximally tolerated dose and stay there for at least six weeks. Patients who tell me they wanna be referred to a specialty clinic or whatnot, I tell them they're gonna do this. This is what they're gonna do. They're gonna have you go, do, go through medicines that you've tried that you don't think work worked for you, they're going to have you take them again. They're just going to do it more slowly. Uh, so here they are. Uh, I, I, let me go back here. Um, magnesium. So the, uh, we have some questions about aura. There is some evidence that magnesium may help with the RS. So if somebody who gets a lot of RS want a medication, I often will 
um, at, uh, use the over-the-counter method, I'll just recommend that they try the magnesium. Uh, Botox, um, probably not something that you guys can offer. Uh, let's talk about these new medicines for a few minutes here. Um, so Gipons, Detons, monoclonal antibodies and devices. The Gipons, so all the triptans, they work through serotonin. Okay, so all the the Gipons, they work with CGRP. CGRP is a neurotransmitter involved in pain uh, modulation and um, has been known to be involved in migraines for many decades. And it took quite a while uh, for them to come up with the uh, CGRP um, antagonists. Um, now the the pills. The Gipons are mainly for the acute treatment of migraines, although uh, the Remigipont has been used for pre as a preventive as well. What are their benefits over triptans? It's not really that they work better. They seem to work about the same, okay? But they don't cause a vasoconstriction. So you could use them in cardio patients with a history of heart attacks or any other cardiovascular risk factors. And they're pretty well tolerated. And um, the hope is, and I think it's kind of bearing out, um, triptans, I told you, it can cause, it has moderate risk of, uh, of causing medication rebound headaches. And there's a lot of hope that Gipons do not. Okay, so that, I mean, after all, the, this one, Rogamaton, is used as, as a daily medicine, as a preventive. So the idea is that, that these, will not lead to medication rebound headaches. Of course, the risk is uh, the cost and also we need long-term data. They've been out for a while, but. Um, titans, the lasmititan is essentially a serotonin um, 5-HT1F, uh, it's a serotonin receptor agonist. So sumatriptan is what we call a dirty uh, I, five, uh, uh, dirty serotonin receptor agonist. It worked on many different serotonin receptors, so it had a lot more side effects. This one is on the other extre extreme, the latest, most selective, and uh, it's not supposed to have vasoconstrictor activity. So, um, you know, the idea is that it is much safer to use. It does have a lot of side effects, um, dizziness, and so I think they're advising patients not to drive for a while, which is a, a, obviously is a big problem for some people. Um, I, I, I forgot to say that with the Gitans, with the, uh, these uh, CGRP, uh, the other benefit is that it's a whole new category. So people who didn't respond to the trip dance, um, you know, uh, the idea would be to just try a different category. Uh, this is uh, the oral, uh, the, uh, so, um, uh, how about uh, uh, the oral preventive medication? I talked about this. This is usually um, the Nurtac um, is the Regematon. This is the Atogepant. Uh, uh, I have to say it's it's a mouthful. I'm not sure I know how to say them, how to pronounce all of them. But um, this slide is mainly for a togepon as a daily preventive medication, okay? These are people who had four to 14 day migraine days a month and the uh, placebo patients had a um, about three day, 2.5 day reduction, okay, a month. And um, uh, the treatment group had a much better improvement, okay? Um, and the results are kind of similar with the, uh, with the rumegaton as well. Just wanted to give you a, a sense that the daily pill did seem to have a uh, significant improvement uh, in reduction, in reducing the headache days. The one thing I wanted to point out is this has been always a problem for headache studies is that placebo patients often do really well. And um, the subcutaneous one, uh, these are large molecule monoclonal antibody preventive medications. 
Uh, this slide is mainly for uh, Aranovab, and uh, this is the Liberty trial. And see here, again, uh, they have the blue is the treatment group, placebo is this group, and the treatment uh, group is uh, definitely doing better. Um, this is the percentage of, of having at least 50% reduction in their headache days. Um, so I think the it definitely offers a new option because the treatment group were people who had failed several preventive medicines and they still responded, okay? So uh, that's really exciting. Uh, the other thing is that, that you know, these are monoclonal antibodies, so there's not a lot of, of drug side effects that are expected, okay? And um, this is mainly per this headache scientist named Gosby, who's done just tremendous amount of work, but he's done a lot of CGRP-related work. It is his opinion that with the CGRP receptor antagonists, so these monoclonal antibodies, that the, the, benefit, the benefit will actually get better over time. And some of the latest studies are showing that. So uh, with that, I think I will stop and open up, uh, open up for more questions. I hope you have a lot more questions. We do have one. Okay. <laughs> Just a reminder, well, right before I read this question that if you have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A box, the chat box, or use the raise hand feature and you can speak directly with Dr. Cho. So the question is, can trauma-induced chronic headaches change the rebound syndrome? Does head trauma influence this? Uh, yes, I think, um, you know, there are people who have post-traumatic headaches and there's really no migraine physiology, pathophysiology involved, but migraines are incredibly common. There's a lot of interesting books and theories out about why we have this your genetic tendency as a human species, what evolutionary benefits did it, um, did it you know, provide? So uh, you know, people who had trauma, whose post-traumatic headaches start to develop a lot of migraineous features um, and develop medication overuse headaches, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, my, my suspicion would be that they have an underlying genetic predisposition and post-traumatic headaches were just on top of that. So let me just finish up with the slides actually here. So um, the headache, the patient who worries me the most is um, actually number two. Uh, the first patient, she's young, she's probably getting her first migraine. The last patient, the you know, a headache that's been going on for almost a year. Um, I get worried when somebody tells me they get morning headaches, it's like an alarm clock, you know, and so on. But it's been going on for a year, it comes and goes. Pain can be on one side or the other. So after seeing that patient, I would say, well, that doesn't sound like that patient has um, a worrisome headache where I have to order a scan or something, but I don't have a name for it. I, and it doesn't quite sound like a migraine, but I do feel like some sort of a primary headache disorder. That's when I go to the ICHD3. So there is this headache known as a hypnic headache, and it has a definition, and the patient meets the criteria. Okay. So I would say, well, hey, you know, and patient, you, you would be happy having a name for it, and the patient would be happy for having a name for it. Second patient, 50 years old, over 50 years of age, uh, patient's headache pattern. This is, it's definitely different. It's a new headache. No nausea, featureless, constant pain, and now associated with some memory changes. Headaches have been present only for a month. This is the patient I would get an MRI of the brain. Thank you very much. I have some other slides that, um, uh, including some of the resources, um, I think you will find a lot of helpful information there. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a question. How do you treat muscle contraction headache, a very common presentation? Yeah, there is some discussion among headache scientists in the American Headache Society, whether like muscle tension headaches, muscle contraction headaches, 
Is that just a manifestation of, of a migraine or is that just a separate entity altogether? Having said that, um, if somebody has muscle contraction headaches, um, you know, all the time, it's, it's, it's not something you can manage with an occasional anti-inflammatory medications, then I go to emitriptyline um, or nortriptyline. Um, start with a low dose and then increase slowly. Uh, if those don't work, I might try things like gabapentin. I've used baclofen for it. Um, I, again, I would use the approach of how many days will you need to take medicines to get rid of that muscle contraction pain? The how, you know, if they have to take something more or less, you know, two days a week or more, uh, week after week after week, I go with a preventive medicine. 